There may be a simple explanation for this. A trick of the moonlight. A confusion of time. A fragment of a dream that tagged itself onto reality. It happened many years ago, but still remains as clear as if it happened yesterday. I've given up trying to puzzle out a logical answer, so I'll put it down just as it came to me and leave you to sum it up. I was commissioned from the Artists Rifles to the East Surrey Regiment in the autumn of 1916 and joined the 9th Battalion in a village behind the lines where they were recruiting their losses on the Somme with drafts from England. Their next destination was Vimy Ridge. We moved up one night to the reserve line in the valley about a mile from the front trenches on the crest. It was the custom, when taking over a new sector of the line, for an officer from each company to go ahead and spend a night with the company they were to relieve. He had to find the way around, see where the sentries were posted and pick up what information he could about the danger spots and how the enemy were behaving. He would take all this back to his company commander and act as guide when they moved in. I was the only officer in our company who had never been in the front line before and its commander no doubt picked on me to get me used to it in advance. So four of us, one from each company, set out one afternoon for the trenches on the ridge. The valley was in dead ground and we walked in the open until we came to the rising land that led up to the ridge. Here we entered a deep communication trench called Blue Bull Alley that zigzagged up the steep incline. The support line lay about a hundred yards behind the front and here we parted, each to find his separate way to the company he was to stay with. My own way led directly ahead, up a trench that had clearly taken a lot of beating. A small working party was repairing the ruined parapet and a corporal directed me to the company headquarters. They were in some deep dugouts called Brown's Burrows. A steep flight of stairs, about 20 steps, led down to them and for the first time I got the feel and the smell of a front-line dugout. A captain was sitting at the candlelit table, sorting out papers, writing out reports. Another officer was opposite, head in hands, reading a magazine. Two more were asleep in bunks beside the walls. The captain glanced up and I introduced myself. He didn't look as if he wanted me, and he wanted me still less when he found out that it was my first time in the line. For that, I couldn't blame him. At the end of an arduous tour of duty, it wasn't a joy to have a greenhorn on his hands. Watson goes on duty at six o'clock, he said, pointing to a bundle on a bunk. You can go up with him, and he'll show you around. In the meantime, you can use the bunk over there. And here's a magazine if you want it. I climbed into the bunk with the magazine. It was a copy of Punch, and no doubt there were some good things in it, but I didn't really feel like Punch at that moment, and in any case, there wasn't enough light to read. So for the next hour, I lay there, occasionally glancing at the captain working at the table. His name, I found out later, was Nisbet. There were officers who managed to keep themselves immaculate under the most discouraging conditions and Captain Nisbet was one of them. He was young, not more I suppose than 25, in a well-cut tunic, light-coloured whipcord breeches of the cavalry type and well-polished cavalry boots. He looked so spruce and clean that he might have come directly from a ceremonial parade instead of being at the end of an eight-day tour of frontline duty in which he had never removed his clothes beyond his tunic when he slept. He was good-looking in a cold, impassive way, but there was nothing mobile in his features. I had thought him aloof when I met him, but that seemed to be his manner towards all his officers. He spoke quietly and deliberately, never smiled or frowned or raised his voice. I would say he was a first-class officer for the work in hand, who never bullied or lost his temper. Towards six o'clock he went to the bunk containing the officer named Watson and gave him a shake. Time to go up, he said. Watson was a cheerful, tubby little man who showed no resentment at having a newcomer on his hands. He seemed, in fact, pleased to have a companion for his wearisome vigil and offered me a peppermint. 
we groped up the steep, dark steps into the front line. The first person we met was the officer on duty, waiting to be relieved. Anything to report? asked Watson. The usual thing, he said. Nothing special. And he hurried off, anxious to get his tea. The usual thing was evidently what I'd heard from down there in the dugout. Its great depth insulated it from the sounds of war, and for most of the time it was as quiet as if we were beneath a hillside on the English downs. But now and then came a dull, crunching thud from somewhere overhead. Once it must have been directly above us, for the whole dugout shook, the candle flames ducked and some loose debris fell from the roof onto the table where Nisbet was working. He had swept it aside and gone on with his work. Watson told me that these were the Minenwerfer, the heavy German mortar shells that caused such havoc when they fell. They were shot high into the air and came straight down. Every company has a mini sentry with a whistle to warn the men on duty. Three blasts if it were falling to the right, two to the left. If he saw it right above him, he blew one blast and bolted for the nearest cover. There was no precision in the aim. Most fell short of the trench or behind it, and as the blast was mainly upwards, they did no serious damage. But a direct hit in the trench could demolish a sentry post and all its occupants. In any case, a very useful weapon in a war of nerves. Nobody knew when the next was coming or where it would fall. The company held about a hundred yards of the front line. The summit of the ridge was no man's land and the main feature of this sector was Ursat's crater, the result of a mine blown earlier that year. What it was intended to achieve, I don't know. But it had blown a deep crater between the opposing lines and both armies had pushed out sentry posts to occupy their sides of it. They faced each other across the crater, not more than 30 yards apart, in easy range of hand grenades. It was a vile piece of line to occupy. The trenches had been so shot about that there wasn't much protection. The opposing front lines were too close together for long-range artillery, but the Germans made up for this with their mortar guns. I imagine that our own mortars gave something in return, but that I didn't know about. All I knew was that we were at the receiving end of what the Germans had to send us. When you know a mini is coming, said Watson, squat down in your trench, cover your ears and tuck your chin down into your chest. If you keep your head up, the blast will knock it back and break your neck. You heard a sharp clang when they were fired, like somebody hitting a tin tray. Then you saw the thing shoot up from behind the German trenches, turning slowly over and over. When it reached its apex, high overhead, it righted itself and came down nose first. The blast was shattering. Several came over that evening, one so close that lumps of chalk rained down around us and you felt as if a mule had kicked you in the back. Sometimes we had a dose of rifle grenades, but they were peanuts compared with the Minenwerfer's shells. In two hours, I knew all I wanted to know about that unhealthy stretch of line and would gladly have gone back to my company in the valley, but I had to spend the night up there. The cook was laying out the evening meal when our tour of duty ended, and during supper Nisbet said to me, I shall be up there from four until dawn. You'd better come up with me. And this led to the strange happening that still eludes me to explain. I got into my bunk and tried to get some sleep. I dozed occasionally but was awake most of the time. Every two hours there was movement in the dugout when an officer went up to take over and the one relieved came down. I was half asleep when Nisbet came over and said, You'd better get ready. It's time to go up. There was a brilliant moon that shone on the chalk trenches with a light as clear as day. The dazzle of it hurt the eyes after those hours in the darkness of the dugout. It was usual in the small hours of the morning for the mortar fire to die away. The gun teams no doubt lay off for a sleep. They were the hours for the machine guns that chattered away from emplacements behind the lines, aiming at long range at road junctions and supply tracks. Nisbet began his tour of inspection, visiting each sentry post and talking to the men. He talked more easily to them than with his officers. I heard him speak of their wives and families and homes. 
Far away down south there was a growling rumble, like distant thunder. They're busy on the Somme tonight, he said. He stood talking to me for a while, then said, I'm going up to the crater post. You better wait till I come back. I guessed why he didn't want me to go with him. I'd been up there with Watson in the afternoon. The trench that led to the crater post was a shambles. If you stood upright in it, you were an easy target. Even at night, you had to crawl on hands and knees because the Germans had fixed rifles trained on it and Nisbet didn't want me crawling along behind him. I stood there alone in an alcove of the trench. The ridge was the highest point in the front line and the view from where I stood was awe-inspiring. You could see the Vary lights rising and falling over no man's land for miles to the north and south, with sometimes the red flash of heavy guns when you heard the big shells rippling far overhead. I had been standing there, I suppose, for about ten minutes when I heard a faint clang of a Minenwerfer being fired. It took me by surprise because there hadn't been one since I'd come up to the trenches with Nisbet and I thought we were free of them till morning. You couldn't see the shell at night, but you could see the splutter of sparks from its fuse. I went through the drill that I was getting used to, squatting down and covering my ears. It fell about fifty yards away, over by the crater post. There was a scatter of debris, but I wasn't much shaken. We had had them closer in the afternoon. I was watching a cloud of black smoke billowing into the sky when Nisbet came round a corner of the trench, about ten yards away from me. He was hurrying, and I stood back in the alcove to let him pass. He went by as if I wasn't there, and a turn in the trench took him out of sight. I am certain it was Nisbet. Although he didn't look at me or say a word, I saw his profile clearly in the moonlight. I assumed that there had been casualties up at the crater post and that Nisbet was hurrying to the company headquarters for assistance. This seemed to fit when I heard voices from the crater post raised more loudly than usual on the front line, somebody calling out orders. Then came the clump of heavy footsteps along the duckboards and the sergeant on duty turned the corner that Nisbet had just come round. He was a big lumbering man who bumped against the trench sides in a hurry. He was out of breath and sweating. He glanced at me and said, The captain has been killed, and lumbered on. Presently he returned with two men carrying a rolled up stretcher across their shoulders. Then an officer came hurrying along towards the crater post. He looked at me as if he'd forgotten my existence and said, No point in you staying here. Better go back to the dugout. Soon after dawn, I packed my haversack and took the way down Blue Bull Alley to rejoin my company. And that is all. There is no more to say beyond what I thought about it afterwards. At the time, the impact didn't register with any clarity. The whole thing left me so mixed up that it hadn't any meaning. But afterwards, when I thought about it calmly, I got no further and never have done since. That it was Nisbet I saw, I have no doubt. Had I known that he had been killed a few moments before, the shock might have created a delusion. I had been with him closely all night, and in the sudden knowledge of his death, a flash of memory might have created his image. But I didn't know. I hadn't linked Nisbet with the fall of the Minenwerfer shell. Several had come down that day without causing casualties. I thought it was just another that had churned up a hole outside the trenches. I wasn't thinking about Nisbet when he came in sight of me around the corner of the trench. His appearance took me completely by surprise. There was nothing about him to suggest anything but a company commander hurrying to get aid for some wounded men. Those who believe such things to be possible may ponder whether his last thought in the split second before his death was the impulse to communicate with his headquarters. He was devoted, I know, to his company. Could the instinct to command have possessed his spirit? I leave that for you to answer. Or is there, after all, a simpler explanation that I have never found?